All right, everybody. Oh, Will's making the echo. <laughs> All right, everybody. Welcome to recitation. Thank you all for being here. Um, so today we're just going to take a day to kind of go over some uh, some application of some of the concepts you've learned. Um, so we're going to be doing a little bit of MATLAB and talking about um, Fourier series and Fourier transforms in MATLAB. So let me go ahead and share. Oh, give me just one second. Okay, I got it working. Can everybody see my screen? You good, Will? Uh, yeah. Okay. All right, so we're gonna be going over this example from the book. So we're going to be evaluating this signal down here as a Fourier series expansion in MATLAB. So it gives us the Fourier series expansion already. So we don't actually have to solve that, which is nice. Um, we just have to write the code for it. So I do want this to be kind of interactive and have people kind of work through the code with me. So please, as we go, feel free, or you're encouraged to talk and share ideas for how to approach this code. So we're gonna go ahead and code this with an A value of 10, which is gonna be our amplitude, and a T of two, which is gonna be our fundamental period. And then we're gonna try truncating it at n is equal to five and n is equal to 10. And then we can explore beyond that as well to see how the Fourier series changes as you change your n value. So I went ahead and I created a rough plot of our x of t function. So from zero to one, our value is gonna be 10. And then from one to two, our value is gonna be negative 10. And then in the actual problem, it's a periodic signal, so that continues on and on and on. But for this example, we only care about the region from zero to two. So we're just gonna use this graph. So what is our first step gonna be for approaching this problem? Does anybody have any ideas? Any ideas? All right, I'll get us started and then y'all can jump in. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get input on what our n value is gonna be. So the n value in this case is similar to the k um, in that it's the multiple of your harmonic. So we're gonna collect what our highest harm harmonic wants to be. All right, so that will prompt the user in the command window to enter the highest harmonic desired. And we're gonna evaluate our Fourier series from zero to that n value they input. So now we need to define our points T. So we're just gonna have T from zero to one, increasing by 0 0.01, or sorry, to two increasing by 0 0.01. All right, so now we got our number of harmonics and we have our T values. Now, how should we approach this problem? So now we get into the math of it a little bit. So somebody give it a shot, please. I want this to be interactive. So what would your next step be? Uh, 
So yeah, so 0 0.01 is just however often you want the function to evaluate. So for this case, I just use 0.01, it's relatively arbitrary, but you could make it smaller to be more precise, or you can make it bigger if you want it to be less precise. Um, so it's basically just at what values of t is the function going to be evaluated. All right. Everyone's scared to give it a shot. I'll walk you through this one, and then hopefully for Will's example, y'all will, will speak up a little more. So now we can see we have this factor out front of our summation that's going to be a constant. So let's go ahead and define that. So our factor is going to be equal to, and it's going to be 4 times a, where a is our amplitude, which in this case is 10. So we're going to have 40 divided by pi. And that is going to be our factor. And then the answer values we're going to get out, we can go ahead and pre-allocate that to just be x of n. And we're just going to set that equal to zero for now, just to pre-allocate it. So now we need to make a loop and do a summation. So we're going to have the summation of 1 over 2n minus 1 times sine of 2n minus 1 omega naught t. So, and we're going to instead of doing this from n equals one to infinity, we're gonna evaluate this from n equals one to wherever we want to truncate our answer. So we're inherently gonna get some error called truncation error based off of when we stop our evaluation as we can't evaluate all the way to infinity. So that's what our n value is representing is how many harmonics do we wanna do? So where do we wanna stop and where do we wanna truncate the equation? So truncation is basically whenever you have an equation like this, where you have a sum from one to infinity and you're coding it, you can only code it through a certain number of steps. You can't take the sum of this all the way into infinity, but you could do it until a minion, a, a minion, a million if you want, excuse me. Um, or you could do it to a thousand, or you could do it to a hundred, or you could do it to 10. Um, so truncation is the error that is resultant in choosing that value. So for truncating it at 10, you're going to have a substantially higher error than truncating it at 10,000, for example. And you'll see that as we continue, but it's basically the number of terms in your summation that you want. Does that answer your question? So I have this question myself. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just working with uh, how many terms should I choose for the, for this? Like, how do I know if the number of summation is good? So um, it's all, so in this case, we're going to plug in a bunch of n values and see how our output changes at different n values. Um, and that's kind of the point of this is to see what happens to the Fourier series as you continue to add terms to it. So the, the higher value you go. Um, but ultimately, it depends on what you're doing and the application you're doing. Um, so that kind of falls under numerical methods. And I'm also in numerical methods right now because I'm taking it a year behind. <laughs> so it's kind of I don't know if I can give the best answer as to when should you like how do you evaluate what your truncation should be? Um, but I think it's very situational on like what the accepted error of the problem is. What I do is just run the code and see if the graph is like weird looking. If it has very sharp edges, then I try to like minimize the number of, or like increase the number of points between like mm -hmm. the limit to make it smoother. But what if we want sharp edges, like in this case? Then you have to like. <laughs> I, I would wait. Um, 
I hope that kind of answers your question at least. And then as we go forward with this, I hope you can kind of see the effects of it on our graph that we're going to produce. So you should be able to get a better visual representation of what I'm talking about as we continue. So I hope that answers your question for now. If you still have the same question at the end, um, please let me know and we can try to talk about it some more. But All right, let me double check this. So Isabella, you're very close. And we do have the frequency defined with our value of t. So this value of t is our fundamental period. And we need omega naught. So the way we're going to get omega naught is we're going to do um, 2 pi over t. So in this case, our t is equal to 2. So omega naught is going to be equal to 2 pi over 2. So our omega naught is going to be equal to pi. But you are very, very close to the right answer with that. Um, with what you typed out in chat. So for n is equal to one to big N, beautiful. We're gonna get an X of N value equal to X of N plus this term out in front, this factor times our sine of 2n minus 1 oh i think there's an error in this all right i think i found an error we're going to try it another way and then see where see what that does um so we're gonna get this times pi times t. And then we're gonna take this um, and we're gonna divide it by 2n minus one. So this loop is going to solve. Um, it's going to solve our equation at each point of n and t and sum them all up. So what is it throwing an error here for? Might be missing a close parentheses. Mm. Why is that missing a close parentheses? Oh, there we go. Okay. So now this loop should give us the output of our Fourier series. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to plot this against t. And our x label is going to be time. Our y is going to be the partial sum. So now if we run this, and if it works correctly, oh. Oh, I typed input instead of input. It helps when you don't mistype things in your code. All right, there we go. So now we can see this is our function x of t plotted over time. 
And remember that this is supposed to be periodic, but we only care about the period from zero to two. So I just plotted that region. So now if we enter the highest harmonic desired, let's go ahead and let's start with two. And hopefully this gives us the right graph. It does not. All right, I missed some parentheses in here. All right, let's try this again. Okay, there we go. So if you remember our original plot, it looked like this, right? Where we have steps from zero to 10 at zero, and then it drops all the way down to negative 10 at one, and then back up to zero at two. And now we can see with an n equal to two, so we have two harmonics here, we have a function that goes up, starts to drop, goes back up, and then goes all the way about down to negative 10, starts going up, goes back down, and then goes back to zero. So you can see it vaguely resembles the general behavior of our function, but it's not a very good model, right? But now, if we increase our value of n, Maybe. Why is it bad? Oh, there we go. Now, if we increase it to five, you can see, okay, you kind of get a little sinusoidal plateau here, and then it drops, and you get another sinusoidal plateau down here. So you can see how the Fourier series, the more terms you add to it, the closer it gets to the mapping of the original function. So let's try again with 10 and see, does it still get better? So if we put in 10, now our graph looks even closer to our original. And as you keep adding more n terms, you're increasing the accuracy of the Fourier series and you're truncating less, so you're getting less error. So let's say we put in 100. Now, this looks really close to our original function. The corners are a little rounded. But relatively speaking, this is very close. For any value from 0.2 to 0.8, you're going to get the same output roughly from this as you would from our original function. The only real errors is going to be at these rounded corners. And it's going to be a relatively small error. So I hope that explains truncation error a little bit, helping you visualize it. Um, but it should also kind of put into context what the, what the Fourier series is doing, where you're taking um, sinusoidals of harmonic frequencies, multiples of your harmonic, and adding them up to create your original signal. Does that make sense to everybody? And does anybody have any questions about the code or about the truncation or anything? This is just a little visualization to help y'all understand a little more conceptually what's going on and how to apply this to a problem. Wait, so what are we doing right now? Are we just plotting the graph where we already calculated? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, we're taking our Fourier expansion, which was actually given to us in the problem, and we're calculating our sum at each point of t up to our value of n where n is our highest harmonic desired. And then we're plotting it. So this is basically our Fourier series mapped out. So once again, if I run it, and I put in 5, 
we get a rough approximation of our function. Not a very good approximation, right? But a rough approximation. And you can kind of see that it's a sinusoid. So you can kind of tell it's composed of a bunch of different sinusoids added together. Now, if we run it again, and we put in 100, Now we have a bunch of sinusoids added together, and it's so many and creates such an accurate map of our original function that you can't really tell it's a sinusoid anymore. But this is just a bunch of sinusoids at different frequencies added up together to get your original function. So any questions? All right, I'm going to hand it over. How do I stop sharing? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> oh. Hey, guys, what's up? Okay. How's everybody doing? You guys still live? Barely. Okay. Let's uh let me check the chat real quick. Okay. We are feeling good. Let's get a sea of thumbs up, guys. We have five of you. Let's get five thumbs ups. Five let's go five for five. Five for five. Thumbs ups. Megan, Isabella, Rebecca. Are you okay? Do we oh just Isabella left. Do we have to call an ambulance for Isabella? Is she in, is she in shock from how great the last presentation was? It would happen to me as well. Okay, so we got four four to five. Isabella is demoted from Signals Prodigy, and you four are now taking her place. Okay, so um, yeah, let's just get, get started. So we're gonna do some MATLAB. Um, so Ryan's a lot with image processing, a lot of that side. Here we're gonna do some time series analysis. So this is relevant for like biopotentials and stuff like EEG, EMG, and such. Okay, so let's hop right in. Uh, just starting from the top, this is a pretty common practice, just clearing and closing, depending, you know, if it's your main script. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna generate some fake data, okay? So we're gonna generate some fake data. And here, I know you guys have not done sampling rate, right? But we have to, we're going to use sine waves because the Fourier transform is all about sine waves. So I thought it would be the easiest example. So you have to define your sampling rate. And your sampling rate means like, you know, when you have this signal in real life, this biopotential, it doesn't stop. Your brain waves don't stop ever. You know, if they stop, you might want to call an ambulance for real, you know. But when we, in the engineering world, when we're trying to take this signal and put it into our computers to analyze it, we just record one data point every certain amount of time. And that's called sampling. Okay. So here I've defined sampling rate. I just made it 1000 because then one sample is one millisecond and it's easy to convert in your head, but you can choose any sampling rate you want. And you're going to learn way more about sampling later. This is not about sampling, just so you know, this is what FS is. And so here we can determine the change in time. So here the sampling rate is in Hertz. So Hertz is one over seconds, right? So by doing one over one over seconds, we can just get the change in time. Okay. And here's just like when we want to stop, want to stop. So the, the end time. Okay, so this is just some initialization, right? Look at this, on the fly comments, making it easier for you guys. Not many can do it like I do it, okay? So now we have a time vector. Okay, I, I chose 0 0.001 instead of zero so that this could be exactly 500 units. So I guess I'll just run it in a sec. So I, actually, yeah, I'll just run it line by line. That might be easiest. So if you're not familiar with MATLAB, quick MATLAB, I put this red dot here. It's called debugging. I just clicked here. You can click and unclick to remove it. And then when you run and that code reaches that line, it'll stop. So the code goes from top to bottom. And once you hit a red line, it'll stop. And so here you can, there's some buttons for you to interface. That's why MATLAB is so easy because you can use this, this interface. So here I'm just going to press step to go one line at a time. Okay. If I were, if I were to press continue, it would just ignore this breakpoint and execute the rest of the code unless there's another breakpoint. Or if I press step, it'll just go line by line. Okay, so let's press step and go line by line 
so you guys can see just everything that's going on. So here we're just initializing some values. Okay, and on the le bottom left here, this is your workspace. You can check in real time what the values of these things are. Okay, so now we're gonna make this time vector. So you can type here size T, or you can just look over here and you see it's one by 500, so that's why I made it 0 0.001. And so basically what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna make three separate sine waves, right? So the Fourier transform is saying that we can take any, any single signal. In this case, it, it will be periodic, but it doesn't have to be periodic. It, it could be any signal. And we're gonna break it up from time domain to frequency domain. So we're gonna separate all the frequencies and we're gonna get a plot of the frequency composition of our signal, which like I mentioned before is useful for many things because a, a lot of times different frequencies will mean different things. So you can learn information about the signal by knowing how much of different types of frequencies are in your signal. So here, FC is our frequency. So I'm just defining this frequency to be one, okay? Or to be five, it's the, it's the first one, but it's five. And so here, I'm just generating this fake sine wave, okay? So this is gonna be our amplitude, right? Our, our y-axis scaling. It's a sine wave. There's no phase, let's not worry about phase for now. There's no phase over here. If there was, it'd be plus or minus something over here, but there's not. And so it's with respect to T, so that's this vector we defined up here, and then just times two pi to convert the hertz, okay? Everybody understand how I got this far? Everyone feeling okay? Give a thumbs up. Isabella is not allowed to ask any questions because she did not put a thumbs up earlier. No, I'm just joking. You can ask questions, Isabella, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, it's a joke. Okay, so I hope we're all feeling good, but if we're not, please speak up. This is time for you guys. Okay, so we're gonna generate these these three sine waves. Okay, let's skip through this. Basically, they're all gonna be different frequencies, right? So five and 15 and 35. So I did that on purpose so that we could, you know, specifically identify these sine waves. And they're of different amplitudes, which matters a lot, right? Because this, this frequency will be represented less in the signal. Later, we're gonna add them, right? Later, we're gonna add them. So because the amplitude is smaller than these two, there will be less of that frequency in the overall signal. So now let's just do some plotting. Okay, let's do some plotting. So if it's gray, they won't actually go. You have to press save. So let's just go right here. Let's run the whole thing again. We can hit press continue. We'll go to the next one. Okay, we can step. And so here's what this looks like. So they're on the same y-axis scale, which is important because they're of different amplitudes. So just a little tip, when you have comparing things side by side, either vertically or horizontally, if they're comparable, it's normally nice to have them on the same scale. So like scale in terms of Y axis limits. Okay. So you can see this one's way smaller. You know, it's oscillating faster, which means it has a higher frequency. This one in the middle, medium frequency. And the largest representation is this lower frequency. Okay. And this is normally, common in at least an EEG. I'm not sure about other signals, but normally you have the lowest, the lowest frequencies have the largest amplitudes. Okay. So, and if you're curious, that's something called power law scaling. You can Google that if you're interested. Thank you, Alpha. Is that scaling? Power law scaling. You can Google that. It's, it's, I think it's beyond the scope of this presentation, but so now we're going to add them. Okay. So let's make a new figure showing the added version. Okay, so now this is our signal, right? We have these three signals and we added them to make this big signal, right? So you can see if we wanted to, we could break it up into this Fourier series and we'd get these three on the left, but we're gonna do a Fourier transform, okay? So there's our overall signal. And now just to make it more realistic, we're gonna generate some noise. So we're gonna make some fake noise. So how I'm doing that is by just using this random function. Okay, and this goes from, I think zero to one, something like that. So I'm just multiplying it by three. It might be it might be zero to point one something like that. But I'm, I'm multiplying it by three. I think it's zero to one. But I'm multiplying it by three. And here I'm going to now just plot the noise so you can see what the noise is like. The noise is going to be your worst enemy when you if you ever do biopotential analysis because you'll always have noise, right? And so here's the noise, just random noise. We don't care too much about that. Okay, everyone with me so far? So far we've made three sine waves of three different frequencies and three different amplitudes, which means the different frequencies will have varying levels of effect on our overall signal. Then we added those to make one big signal, and now we made some noise. We added that noise to our signal, or at least we're going to do that right now. 
So after we add this noise, here's what we get. Something like this. So you see, now it's not as pretty, right? It's going to be like the eye doctor, guys. Ready? One or two? One or two? OK, I'm sorry. It was not funny. So this is the one with noise. It's a little bit, it has these little random oscillations. And so now we're going to do an actual Fourier transform. Thank you, Isabella. Normally, I don't think people think my jokes are funny, but I think they're funny, and that's why I say them. So what is this, guys? What is this? It's Is this something in MATLAB's function? No. My initials are William Null, so I made some edits. So what you could do is type in FFT, and it would do a Fourier transform. But we're not going to do that. I made my own special script for doing Fourier transforms. And I'll go into that while we're, while we're going in there, OK? So now let's go a step in. OK, guys, so this is a main script. So this is just like me running general lines of code. But you can you can make a function. And you can use different functions that you make and put them in your main script. So that way, it's your code can be cleaner. So when you have little things that um, are replicable, you can make a function out of it. And then you save some some space in your main, your main code. And it's, it's easy, because then you can just edit this on the side, and you don't have to edit your whole thing. So that's some little programming stuff. So we can press step in. So now we're going to leave this signals recitation file. We're going to step in, and we're going to go into what this function actually does. So this is called FFT underscore will null. And it takes in the data and the sampling rate. And the sampling rate is important, because that's how many frequencies we can determine based on how many points we have in the sampling rate, right? which I'll go into in a sec. So here I'm just doing some more initialization. So the number of points are gonna be the length of the data. And one, one other tip when you're doing debugging guys, it's nice because you can hover over stuff and it'll tell you the value. So I can see what's inside these things by just hovering my mouse over it. So here I can see that this is one by 500. This is the data I inputted. This is the, the sine wave that we added, the total sine wave. Here's how many data points are in it. And so now I feel like this was a little simple, right? All we did was make three sine waves when we added them. But now I want this part to be a little bit more interactive because here's here's the learning, guys. So you haven't learned this yet, but this is called Nyquist. So basically, depending on how long you record for, how many data points you have, and your sampling rate will determine how many frequencies you can actually have. So here, because we sampled at 1,000 hertz, we can actually only find frequencies of up to 500 hertz. And you're going to learn why later. So I don't want to go too much into it. But basically, you have to be able to record at least one full cycle, right? So if it's something, let's say, is at 100 hertz and you sampled at 150 hertz, you wouldn't be able to sample fast enough because you would you would basically miss recording at least two points per cycle. So you're going to go into that later. But briefly, just trust me, there's something called the Nyquist frequency, the Nyquist rate, and you're going to sample at a certain rate and you can only record frequencies half of that rate. So we sampled that 1,000 hertz, arbitrarily defined. So we can actually only find frequencies of, of up to 500 hertz. And normally, there's like an engineering Nyquist, which is like a 3.5 so instead of the divided by 2. It's like a divided by 3.5 or something. But yeah. OK, any questions so far, guys? So here's our the maximum frequencies we can find. OK? And then we're going to initialize some more. So now I want to pause and and go over this a little bit, guys. So we have a sampling rate of 1,000 hertz, which means we can only find frequencies of up to 500 hertz. And so why do you guys, um, let's see, how can I phrase this? So basically here I'm saying that, um, actually, no, I think this is, I think I can actually go over this instead. And we'll do a pause later. So here, we're just doing some linear uh, spacing to find the total frequencies based on the number of points we have, right? So we know that the max is 500. And now we're going to say n over 2. So we're going to say that the actual frequencies we can find is 250 hertz. And now here is where I'd like to pause. So how did we go? Why can we only find 250 frequencies? Guys, we sampled at 1,000 hertz, which means we can find frequencies of, frequencies of up to 500 hertz. So why, why can we actually only find frequencies of up to 
250 here in this case. Any, any guesses, guys? Do you guys remember from last recitation, or on, on Sunday, actually, if you were there, how we talked about that there were negative frequencies? So can we five, find that up to 500 in both ways? What do you guys think? Can we find 500 negative, 500 positive? Okay, I guess, wait, wait, I'm not looking at chat. Oh, wait, here. The n over two. Speaking right. like if it's if it's two hundred fifty, wouldn't that be n over four? Mm -hmm. So we can we can, but here by saying n over two, we're saying that there's at least for now. Um, so for the Fourier coefficients, right? We're saying that. Let's see. How can I explain this? So you'll have some negative frequencies, right? Which means which is a product of the Eulers. So you'll have some negative frequencies, but negative frequencies don't actually have any physical meaning. So here I'm saying N over two instead of N. So that we'll actually have only 250 frequencies, but you can find up to 500. So the reason I did this was because we want to kind of attribute um, some of the like composition of the negative frequencies into the positive frequencies, if that makes sense. So we're going to basically remove the negative frequencies and double the positive frequencies. It's kind of like a visual thing, but in reality, it doesn't really change anything. Okay. So let me show you. So now we're going to find the Fourier coefficient. So here we, is where we actually do the FFT. Okay. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. So you actually, you can't find, find out the 500 frequencies. So Nyquist holds is true. 1000 sampling rate, 500 frequencies, but because you'll have some negatives, we kind of, Double the positive, if that makes sense. It's a it's a little thing. I, I don't think um that's not something like on the test or or on the homework or anything. It's like a little thing just for visual aspect here. Okay. So here we're gonna actually compute the Fourier transform. Okay. And here you're gonna you're gonna see what we get. So do you guys remember the, the Fourier transform, the formula? Why are there complex things in there, guys? We have real plus complex. What does that even mean? What does that even mean, guys? Help. It's just because of either so you have complex part. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I really want to hammer this home, guys, because if you're gonna do any time frequency and uh you know advanced uh time series analysis in the future. This will be very important. If you're not, then you can you can turn off your your brain for a second. So on the y-axis we have imaginary, and here we have real, right? So in the Fourier transform we have the Eulers, right? Which means we have the cosine. I like to say Euler. I know it's Euler. This should be a J, sorry, it should be a J. Plus J, sine. My handwriting is awful, guys, let me get a mouse. How come they say Euler, Euler, and not Euler? Okay, I don't, say Euler, Euler. I don't have a mouse, but you guys will have to, you, ha you have to endure, okay? So here we have cosine plus J sine of theta, right? So here, Euler says that this equals one. All right, so here's our thing. And by finding this imaginary and real value, right? So here's what we're, we just found. So we just found, can I stop annotating? There we go. Right, so let's look a little bit into this. So here, we're finding the real and imaginary coordinates, right? So we're able to find information about this vector. Okay, and if we just were to ignore this imaginary component, we would lose a ton of information about the phase. So we didn't have any phase here, so I'm not sure if it would matter. I don't 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 quote me on that. But by having this imaginary component, we can extract information about also the phase. So that's like a little thing. But if you were to ignore it, you would only really find the projection onto here, right? You'd only have information about this. The projection here. Projection onto the real axis. You had no imaginary component. 
So you would lose information about the face. Okay, that's really it. I don't wanna to go too much into that. So basically we found these Fourier coefficients, okay? And now we can plot them. So you're gonna do something like this. So before I plot it, let's get some intuition here. I love intuition. So I want you guys to explain to me why I did what I did here. So here we have this one by 500 Fourier coefficients, right? We have our one by 500 guys. We found our 500 frequencies, we're done. Wrong, you're wrong, we're not done. So now inside here is one to just length frequencies of 250. So I want you guys to explain to me number one, why I did absolute value and number two, why I did the times two. The times two should be easy guys. If you don't get 100% on that question, you're failing my recitation. I, I don't know why I can't do it. We talked about it earlier guys. Come on, I believe in you guys. Think you can do it. There's no rush. There's no rush. Take your time. Okay. We have an absolute value. We just talked about the absolute value or the times two. We have a times two and there's an absolute value. So what happens when you take the absolute value guys of a real and imaginary vector? What do you get? What's the answer? Or of any vector. If it's XY. It's and you take the is it TAI? Your TA had to answer for you guys. I hope you're I hope you're ashamed. <laughs> No, I'm just joking, guys. I'm way too hard on you, but I love you all. Thank you for coming. Please stay and go. Okay. So that, that's why. So absolute value, we find the magnitude of that line, right? So remember before I, I talked about the projection? If there's only the real value, we don't we lose information about the phase. So to get information that includes the phase, we take the absolute value. So along, I'm not sure I can control Z, my annotation, can I? Oh my God, I can. Okay. So here, yeah. So we take the absolute value and we find the magnitude of this line. We found the magnitude. Otherwise, we would only have the projection, which is not enough information, guys. Then our Fourier transform would change depending on the phase of our input signal, which is not good, because then we're getting wrong information. Okay. So that's why we have absolute value, and we do the times two, because we're it's like a visual thing, right? Remember we have the the two fifty, so we're just kind of like shifting it to the right. Okay. That way we don't have any negative frequencies. We're actually I guess we're not really shifting it to the right. We're actually like removing the negative and doubling the positive, which is the same. Well, not the same, but similar. Does that make sense? It's actually not a shift. Actually, never mind. It's not really a shift. You're you're removing the negative and you're doubling the positive. Exactly. Isabella, you're back to prodigy. <laughs> Wait, when did you got out of prodigy? <laughs> okay, great job, guys. I don't want to go too much into this and, and, and bore you to death, but um, if you're interested in anything that EEG or any biosignal, this is important stuff. Or image processing. Okay, so I think there was an N here, wasn't there? I think I deleted it by accident. Actually, that could be that could be a fun test. Okay, so actually no, for now we'll just actually do the what I was doing. I'm too scatterbrained, guys. Okay, let me hide this. Okay, so now we're gonna actually get our our plot. Finally, Wilma was talking for way too long. So here's what we got, guys. On the x-axis is frequency, and the y-axis is amplitude. So do you guys remember the frequencies we put in? It doesn't matter because we could find out here, right? So here we can just hover over to find the x-axis value. So here we see it's four. The actual frequency we put in is five, right? So pretty close. And here 16, and here 36. So we had put in 15 and 35, right? So here we were able to find the frequency content of our signal and its corresponding amplitude. So we can see here that the five, you know, four to five the, uh, frequency is way more present in the signal than these other two, right? Can everybody interpret this plot? Does this make sense, guys? Let's get some thumbs up in the in the chat. Does everybody understand how to interpret this plot? The y the y axis is just arbitrary amplitude. You don't have to even think about it. And the x axis is is frequency. Are they giving thumbs up? I can't actually see. Thumbs up, guys. There's only Isabella and Rebecca left. Okay, that's not good news. Okay, let's move on. Oh, there's a question. Is the difference in the frequency and what we put in? 
just the air. I think uh, I I didn't I haven't added the noise yet actually. I I think it's because the noise is what we're gonna do next actually. I'm not a hundred percent sure about that. I'll have to I'll have to think about that and get back to you. It might be because I started at zero point zero zero. No, that shouldn't do anything. Let me let me get uh, think about that and I'll get back to you. Okay. Next recitation or over the weekend. Like not enough. Yeah, not enough points maybe. Maybe our sampling rate is too low or something. Mm. But since we're sampling at one thousand and our frequency is five, yeah, I'm not hundred percent sure. Let me think about it. And I'll get back to you. That's a great question. So now we're gonna add some noise and do the same thing. So here we added this noise here. Remember that? And we're gonna do the same thing and just show that real quick. So now you see, still it's very obvious here, but we see a little bit more of the random noise, just ra random uniform noise. So we see a little bit of that all the way up to our Nyquist, right? So here, yeah, still 36 and 16 and four, okay. Yeah, let me get back to you on that though. That's, that is interesting. Okay, how are we feeling guys? Any questions? Rebecca and Isabella, thanks for coming. If I could give you extra credit, I would. You give us your social security number instead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> credit card number is okay. so Are you guys alive? Thank you for coming. We're going to end a bit early today. You guys just finished the test and you're still here for the recitation. Thanks for coming. Superstars. Superstars. Good job, everyone. You have my respect. And that's not easy to earn. Oh, I wanted to say real quick, the problem that I did is kind of similar to the MATLAB and homework score. It's not the same, but you should see similar results to when I was increasing our end value in uh, in the code I ran and when you plot on homework score. So just keep that in mind. Rebecca and Isabella, you have bright futures ahead, guys. Keep up the hard work. Okay, I think we'll stop the recording and we'll end it for today, guys. Good luck with the rest of your exams. Have a good fall break.